My name's Janet. I'm one of the dietitians working at St. James's in Leeds. So currently I'm a, I'm a registered dietitian. So I work um, in the non-surgery oncology team. Um, so, so I'll, I'll just get on with it then <laughs> and I'll show this presentation. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see. I hope everyone can see this now. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so just firstly, actually, thank you to Target Ovarian for asking me to lead this webinar, but also thank you of all the ladies here who have just tuned in and are willing to listen to me as well. So I've got a presentation here that I'd like to share with you, and I hope that you gain something out of it. And, and there'll be some questions at the end as well, which I'm, I'll try my very best to answer to the best of my ability. Um, so today I plan to talk about diet, nutrition, ovarian cancer, but also what that means in lockdown. So again, my specialty is in non-surgery oncology. So there are some questions if there's regarding surgical sort of side of things or stomas and things, I might not, I might not be the best person to answer, unfortunately, but I will try my best to share what I do know and I'll try and direct you to some, uh, to some websites or some links that might help and give you a bit more information as well and direct you to some people as well. Okay. Um, so I just have this slide here and it's just almost to show, uh, you know, the, the information that's out there, which can be very confusing and I appreciate it can be very confusing as well. And, you know, as you type in and Google nutrition and dietetics, uh, nutrition and cancer, you know, what kind of information is out there, you know, all these different messages that come out, things in the media, which can be quite confusing as well. And so I guess this is just sort of to almost capture what's out there and hopefully I'll be answering some of your questions and trying to make it a bit clearer as well of, of what you should be following and what's appropriate for you as well. So in general today I plan to talk about sort of the basic principles of and the benefits of a healthy balanced diet and the recommendations that I'll be discussing will be based on the World Cancer Research Fund. So it's a very large charity which has funded lots of scientific research and the evidence that's shown that there are several links between some diet, nutrition, physical activity and cancer. And so from that research, they've then come up with several recommendations, which I'll be basing my presentation on as well. In some situations, it might be appropriate to talk about weight management. So I'll um, be talking about that and it might be relevant for some individuals, it might not be, but hopefully a little bit, bit clearer at the time. I'll also talk about nutrition support and then low fiber diets that some individuals might be following and um, a bit about stomas. But again, it's not my specialty. So I'll sort of share what I know um, and it might be quite brief. But again, if you have further questions, it might be that my colleague, um, uh, you have to, so I have, might have to direct the question or so. Again, sort of lockdown, hopefully some practical tips. In the very end, I'll have a slide of sort of all the links, which I find quite helpful to gain more information about nutrition and some also some reliable um, resources as well for further information and some evidence as well. So with World Cancer Research Fund, their recommendations from the, the, the research they've looked into with the links between diet, nutrition, physical activity and cancer are very also in line with the government recommendations of healthy eating, which is why I've got this sort of slide up. So this is what, and I'm pretty sure that quite a lot of people have probably seen this before as well. So this is the Eat Well Guide, and this is almost a tool that's used by the government to define healthy eating. And so you have the different food groups and it sort of compiles what a balanced and healthy diet would be. And you've got the different colors representing different food groups and the larger the section the more of that food group you should be having in comparison to the other food groups so for example here on your left it's the fruits and vegetables in green on your right in yellow it's the carbohydrates and things like that and actually they take up more of your diet in comparison to say the pink section at the bottom which is your your your, your proteins and things like that i'll go into a bit more detail but again this is sort of very much sort of healthy balanced eating balanced diet but also in line with world cancer research fund and the evidence to suggest that this is probably what we should be following with regards to starchy carbohydrates, there'll be things like your, your pasta, your brown bread, your potatoes, your cereal, porridge, um, sort of your carby, starchy carbohydrates. So it'd be things like um, choosing the whole grain options is what we recommend. So your brown bread, brown pasta, brown rice, basmati rice, these whole grains are a really good source of fiber to help you feel fuller for longer. But actually it's important to base your meals around these whole grain options because actually they give you, they're often broken down first to give you that energy. So it's really important that you have it on a regular basis, but just choosing more of the whole grain and option options and also often 
the um, the cereals and sort of porridge and things like um, sort of your Weetabix and your bread often are fortified with extra minerals and vitamins as well. So actually they're really beneficial for your health. Often in the media, it says, you know, that often there's this message of saying actually carbohydrates are bad for you. They're actually not because you've got all this these nutrients and essential minerals and vitamins from them and we've also got the fiber and the whole grain options which we'd be choosing the negative side of it i guess what they try and portray is, is bad is often we overreach these this portion group often a, you know it's very much the center of our plate we put it on first in our on our plate and we usually have larger portions and often because we overeat with this portion um we often sort of have that excessive energy so then that causes weight gain so there's that kind of misconception that starch carbohydrates are bad when actually they're not it's just that we often overeat and actually that can contribute towards weight gain so it's just being careful of those portion sizes i'd probably say sort of a fist size portion so if you're having a jacket potato if you're a sort of a petite lady you know your fist is going to be smaller than someone who's a bit taller a bit bigger who's got a bigger portion and um, with a bigger fist so it's almost sort of individualized portion sizes as well being mindful of cooking methods again trying to use more of the healthier um steaming boiling rather than frying or roasting sort of your oil uh, roasting in oil or things like that again if you find that you know you plate up your carbohydrates quite a lot it may be that you put on um put on your plate your vegetables and then you put protein first before you then put on your your starchy carbohydrates on your plate to try and balance out those portion sizes as well with regard to your fruits and vegetables, we suggest aiming for at least five portions of different fruits and vegetables a day. And there's actually a study out there that suggests there's a meta-analysis, which suggests that actually we should be aiming for more than five, and it suggests even eight to 10 portions. And they've linked that to health benefits with cancer as well. Um, but actually, you know, in terms of a, a government perspective recommendations, actually we chose actually to continue with recommending five or at least five different portions of fruits and vegetables a day. And um, because actually, as a nation, we're not really achieving the five at the moment in time, let, you know, let alone sort of trying to aim for eight or 10 portions. So we say still try and have at least five. So roughly one portion is maybe about 80 grams. So it might be like a small apple, a medium sized apple. It might be a medium sized banana or like a handful of grapes or berries. Or it might be like three heaped tablespoons of maybe like sweet corn or peas or something like that. So trying to have lots of different types of your fruits and vegetables. So I'm just thinking of that color. You want the lots of different color in your diet. So you've got all the wide range of minerals and vitamins from them. They're also a really good source of fiber as well. So eating more than one portion of the same fruit, say if you have two apples that doesn't count as two portions it just counts as one and um, so it's just trying to aim for different ones again frozen vegetables tinned or dried fruit they all still count as five a day so making the most of it especially in lockdown you know if you're struggling to go out often uh, or if you do your food shop once every couple of weeks it's maybe that you do rely on a bit more of the frozen tin dried fruits so it lasts a bit longer because the fresh fruit often perishes quite quickly so if you struggle with that then it's maybe stocking up on those and making sure you have that ver ver the variety in your diet as well your lentils beans and pulses they also contribute to one of your five a day but then they're also a really good source of fiber and also protein so it's a good non-meat alternative protein rich source i'd always recommend them as well if you struggle to introduce your fruits and vegetables if you struggle to have five portions a day it's maybe starting off early so maybe having it you know with your breakfast say if you have some berries or fruit with your cereal or with your porridge or something it's starting off early so you start having that fruit and vegetable maybe stacking between meals having it as a healthy snack alternative or something making the most of dried fruit as well having it as a snack and, and putting in puddings as well as a good way protein rich foods so we recommend at least having two to three portions of protein rich foods a day that doesn't just mean meat it can also include things like your beans pulses lentils chickpeas eggs fish and um, sort of your leaner meats as well so world cancer research fund we rec they recommend that we should be limiting red meat in particular so not having any more than three portions of red meat a week so roughly a portion we'd almost say is like almost like your palm the size the palm size of your hand um or if it's like a piece of fish it's maybe like the length of your hand is one portion of fish again trying to limit your consumption of processed meat as well so processed meat would it be anything that's sort of salted cured sort of transformed in some way of like ferment fermentation or smoked or something like that so it might be like salami burgers hot dogs chorizo and um, bacon these generally are very high in salt very high in fat and there's no sort of nutritional benefit from them 
again, sort of choosing more of the meat free alternatives to so things like your tofu, corn, lentils and pulses. Again, if you're struggling with that or if you've got family members who don't like sort of the non meat alternatives, then it may be that you do sort of mixture of half and half. So I found that, you know, mixing minced meat with half corn mints as well sometimes can just mask that flavor again you're cutting back on your actual red meat and um, but also introducing more of this high protein source of meat free alternatives again maybe having meat free days within the week can also help with this so protein is also really important because it's important for sort of your muscle muscle mass um, building your body building blocks as well really important with your protein and um, so it's really important you have protein with that of milk and dairy products the recommendations are for you to have at least three portions of milk or dairy products a day so roughly one portion would be might be like a 200 ml milliliter glass of milk or it might be like a small yogurt pot roughly about 125 grams or it might be a small matchbox size of cheese so it might be about 30 grams of cheese something like that so government recommends at least having three portions a day and that's for sort of general adults if you're a woman post-menopause then you'll need a lot more dairy products or a lot more calcium in your diet so sort of your other alternatives so sort of your your plant-based sort of calcium source would be things like your green leafy vegetables and um, sort of fortified cereals and things like that but actually if you struggle with dairy products which is your main source of calcium then it might be that we want to be looking towards maybe taking a calcium supplement and for women who post-menopause again because you need a lot more and if it's quite hard for you to get the the the, the number of portions in you're probably aiming for at least five or six portions at least and if you're struggling with that or you don't like dairy then it might be worth actually taking a supplement with that and I know there was a question submitted actually um, asking what can you do to maintain sort of your good bone health and actually it's actually um, making sure you have adequate calcium in your diet and um, so by actually making sure you have your milk and dairy products but also having enough vitamin D as well. And I know there's another question about vitamin D and actually whether we get enough from our diet. And, and the actual answer is no, we don't. We don't get enough vitamin D from our diet. The dietary source of vitamin D would come from oily fish, eggs, any fortified cereals or spreads or anything. But again, diet alone does not give us enough vitamin D. Vitamin D, our main source from it comes from the sun. So when our skin, our bare skin is exposed to sun, um, then it can make vitamin D in the skin. And roughly within sort of the summer period, so say from April to September, if you can go outside daily for sort of short periods of time, if you have sort of your skin exposed to the sun, then at that point, the sun would be enough to, for you to, for your body to produce enough vitamin D in store. But actually in the winter time, with, so from October all the way up until March, actually there's not enough sunlight in that situation. And so we wouldn't be able to produce enough vitamin D and we wouldn't get enough from our diet. So actually at that point, I would be recommending everyone actually to be having a vitamin D supplement during that period of time. But if if actually if you're a woman above the age of 65 or if you're not going out as often so if you don't have that exposure to sunlight or if you're not cut if you're always covered up um or if you've got darker skin um then I would be recommending actually vitamin D supplement all year round because actually your skin won't make as much vitamin D um, and so you might not be getting enough. So with regards to that, I'd suggest actually maybe speaking to sort of a local pharmacist or speaking to your medical team so they can advise you on how much vitamin D you should be having. Um, again, sort of, I sort of try and link vitamin D and calcium together because vitamin D actually helps absorb the calcium in your gut. So even if you have sufficient amounts of calcium but not enough vitamin D, then your body's not going to be absorbing the calcium as well as it hopes to and it, it should do so actually it's trying to find the balance of both so having adequate vitamin d but also adequate calcium to maintain that bone health and if you're post menopause then actually you want to be more you're having more of the calcium okay fat and sugar so when i talk about sugar i talk about I'm, I'm talking about sort of the added sugar that we should be avoiding so natural sugar so things that are found in your fruits your milk healthy starchy foods like your whole grains and pulses they're the good sugars the natural sugars that you want to be having in your diet and including in a balanced diet what i suggest is limiting your your added sugar so your refined sugar your things in sweets and um, so what um, the world cancer research fund recommend actually limiting your consumption of 
sugar sweetened drinks so things like your full fat options of of your fizzy drinks and um it's maybe make, making sure you go for more of the diet options or the no added sugar options and you know added sugar squash or something and um, drinking more water that's um sort of un unsweetened drinks or water tea and coffee fruit teas or something instead of those fizzy drinks or, or drinks that are high in sugar Avoid, I'd suggest, I've put a, a, um, a bullet point at the bottom to say avoid drinking more than one glass of fruit juice a day. And the reason is for, although it's natural sugar, one glass a day would be one of your five a day. But if you have more glasses of that fruit juice, it's not going to contribute towards any more of your five a day, but it'll just be sort of added natural, extra natural sugar, which isn't, isn't it's not required, it's not needed. And so if you could, I'd probably suggest maybe diluting water so then it goes a longer way. So you've got more to drink, more volume to drink, or maybe going for more of like the, the non-added sugar squash or something instead. So with regards to fat, on the left, you've got two main types of fat. So you've got almost like your bad fats and you've also got your good fats. So your bad fats are what we call saturated fats. So that would be things like your meat, your meat products, your dairy products, coconut oil as well. So often in the media, you've got this kind of message saying that coconut oil is good for you. And there are some aspects of coconut oil which are good, but actually it's predominantly saturated fat. And that's not good for you because the saturated fat increases what we call bad cholesterol. So with cholesterol, there's good and there's bad. And these are very simplified terms. And um, so the bad fats increase bad cholesterol. And so we want to try and limit that as much as possible um, and where possible as well again in pastries creams chocolate crisps and puddings almost like your treats your sweets they tend to be very high in saturated fat again processed foods takeaway fried food food they oft, often contain lots of saturated fat as well so it's trying to reduce that as much as possible and choosing more of the healthy alternatives with your meats and your leaner meats as well or maybe going for more of those meat free days or the non-meat alternative foods that are high in protein so things like your corn or your soy products your tofu and things like that so your unsaturated fat that's what we call the healthier fats. So that'd be things like your olive oil, your vegetable oil, your avocado seeds, nuts, oily fish. So again, these help maintain good cholesterol. So we suggest trying to do sort of like for likes to swap them, but also try and overall reduce the amount that you eat. So it's, it's, it's being careful not to have too much fat in your diet, whether it's good or bad fat, because fat in the end of the day is very high in calories, regardless of whether it's got the good fats or the bad fats and that contributes excess calories and then it contributes towards weight gain and that's just um just to be careful of as well so again i think there was a question that was submitted and it was a lady sort of asking about sort of what to do if they have high cholesterol um and and so with regard with regards to high cholesterol what i would recommend is try and aim and for reducing your sugar intake of that added sugar. So natural sugar is fine, but try and reduce that added sugar and the refined sugar. Try and reduce your fat intake as well. And try and have, if you were to have some fats, it'd be more of the, the healthier fats, your oily fish, your nuts, your seeds, avocados, but to maintain that good cholesterol and try and reduce your saturated fats. So things like your meat, your meat products, it's maybe trying to cut off that visible fat, removing the skin from the chicken or something before you cook it. Um, or try and go for like say your 1% fat milk or um, semi skimmed or skimmed milk rather than your full fat milk because milk is still a really good source of protein and and, and, and um, calcium and again with uh, again with meat that's a really good source of protein and you've got your minerals and vitamins from that as well it's just trying to choose healthier options but also limiting um, that excess fat problems and trying to remove that as much as possible but I believe with this question as well they also mentioned that they're sort of post-surgery as well so if you're post-surgery and you've got high cholesterol I probably suggest actually continuing to have your protein sources so that you can aid with that wound recovery for your um from your surgery and try to to sort of reduce and the fat intake and reduce your sugar intake if you're past your recovery period from surgery you're fit and well you're healthy living with and beyond ovarian cancer um but you've got high cholesterol or you're overweight then i'd probably suggest maybe trying to lose a bit of weight so you go back into sort of what we call a healthy bmi and some weight loss along with these healthy dietary changes can just help reduce the, the sort of your biochemistry your, your sort of um reduce your your cholesterol and your triglycerides and fat in your blood as well with regard to the alcohol, the World Cancer Research suggests that actually there's no safe intake 
with alcohol. So actually we wouldn't recommend it, but we acknowledge that individuals will want to drink it. And so government recommendations are to not exceed any more than 14 units a week. And we try and spread that over the week as much as possible. So not, not having it over a weekend and having all of your limit in a weekend, try to cut down by having several drink free days as well. And again, we kind of call it as what we, what we suggest alcohol is, is empty calories. So they provide lots and lots of calories. They, contribute towards weight gain and the excessive calories, but actually there's, they're empty because they don't provide any nutrition whatsoever. You've not got any extra benefits from having alcohol apart from sort of maybe the enjoyment from it and actually it being a treat for yourself if you find that you enjoy it. So roughly 14 units would be maybe like six, maybe small glasses of wine or six pints or something like that of beer. With regards to sort of your body mass index, quite often people may have already come across this. And they, if you haven't, it's what we use to sort of, it takes into account your weight and also your height. And there's a calculation that kind of puts this, it summarizes this calculation in sort of what we call your BMI. And BMI kind of takes into proportion your weight and your height and your proportion of each. So if your BMI, if you've got a normal healthy BMI, it's roughly in, a, in the range of 20 to 25. If you're 18.5 or less, it's what we classify as underweight. If you're 25 or above, you're overweight or obese if you're above 30. So actually, if you're an individual, you're living with and beyond cancer, ovarian cancer, and you've not got any nutritional concerns you've not got an issue with your appetite and you're not on any treatment then actually what I would be suggesting is to maintain your healthy weight so trying to have a BMI of 20 to 25 if you're above that it might be considering some gradual weight loss um, and trying to maintain sort of what we classify as a healthy balanced diet so what I've just sort of spoken about in the previous slides and that's what World Cancer Research Fund recommend so aiming to be a healthy weight with regards to weight management, if you're an individual eating well, no nutritional concerns, but you're categorized as overweight and you're not on any treatment, then I'd maybe suggest actually looking into some weight management, but that's implementing the healthy eating advice, which I mentioned earlier. And it's roughly thinking about a 500 calorie deficit each day. So that would roughly equate to maybe one to two pound weight loss. And it's quite gradual weight loss over a week. So one to two pounds a week. And I wouldn't avoid, I wouldn't suggest any sort of crash dieting because actually crash dieting you go on this really extreme diet and often people lose lots and lots of weight quite quickly but because the diet is so extreme it's really hard to maintain and so when people can't sustain that diet they revolt re, sort of resolve and go back onto their normal diet and they regain that weight and often what happens is that sort of weight then yo-yos it goes up and down and each time you regain that weight it becomes even harder for you to lose that weight and so that's why we suggest try and make small changes start off small try and maintain that so it becomes more of a lifestyle choice rather than a crash diet so it's just healthy eating 500 calorie deficit each day to result to that gradual weight loss try to choose the lower fat options the things like your semi-skimmed skimmed milk low fat um sort of cheeses low fat yogurts but just be careful because sometimes for example low fat yogurts they might be high in sugar because obviously the, the less fat it has it probably doesn't taste as nice so to improve the taste the companies tend to increase a bit more sugar in them so just watch out for that as well on the bottom left, I've just shown a sort of a plate to suggest the proportion of each of the food groups you should be having if you're trying to lose some weight. So, for example, you want maybe half your plate to be your vegetables and maybe having a snack of a fruit or as a snack or something, a quarter of it. So a very small portion of your carbohydrate and then a quarter of your plate to be your kind of your leaner meats. So maybe choosing things like your chicken, your corn or um, sort of cutting off or removing any of that visible fat from the meat and um, it's thinking about your cooking methods and maybe grilling it so the the fat drips out um, or boiling fish or you know, poaching fish to make it more of a healthy approach rather than adding plenty of oil and if you are to cook you could even use sort of things like spray oil rather than pouring oil because often with pouring oil you don't actually realize how much you've poured into the pan so it could be using spray oil or even like measuring it out into a tea and into like a teaspoon or something so you know how much you're using again trying to increase your physical activity so aiming, government recommendations is aiming for at least 30 minutes um, a day, five days a week of moderate intensity activity. So I always describe more moderate intensity as, say, for example, if you're doing the activity, you can talk 
quite well, but you can't sing because you're a bit out of breath from doing the activity. So that's kind of moderate activity. And so on the bottom left, I've just got a little small plate and it's just to suggest actually to start off with, it might not be that you need to cut lots of things out of your diet. It might be that you just reduce your portion sizes. So actually overall, you're having less calories overall, having a smaller plate so you're not inclined to pile up the food on there as well. I've just suggested, you know, having a treat day, which is often, you know, having a healthy balanced diet, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't have treats because we appreciate treats and we enjoy them and they should be there you know for that quality of life and there's supposed you know food is supposed to be something that you enjoy and um, so but it's just having it in moderation so maybe set yourself a target okay so for a week you only allow yourself to have two treats you know one on this day one on this day so at least you're not inclined to then sort of binge eat or have a snack you know and that's out of your diet or something like that and if you do end up overeating on a sweet on a sweet or a treat it's okay just take it one day at a time tomorrow start a fresh it doesn't mean that you've ruined your diet it's just a lifestyle choice and it's making that as a gradual um a gradual change in your diet so if you're an individual who's living well really sort of good nutrition you've not got any concerns you're not on any treatment and if you're overweight then it might be considering some weight loss if you're within the healthy bmi range it's maybe just implementing the healthy eating advice the whole grain options your leaner meats reducing your red meat reducing your processed meats making sure you're physically active reducing your alcohol intake as well that's kind of the dietary advice we'd be recommending and also what world cancer research fund also recommends as well as well as the government but for those individuals who are really struggling with treatment, and so, for example, with treatment, you know, you, um, you've got lots of different side effects, especially from chemotherapy. You might find that you've got no appetite, reduced appetite. You might have disinterest in food. Uh, if you're nausea, if you feel nauseous, you're vomiting, fatigue, dry or sore mouth or mouth ulcers even, um, taste changes, loss of taste. I've had some individuals who say that they even have a heightened sensitivity to taste. So, do you know, things taste too salty or too sweet or lack of taste, or if you feel quite full quite quickly quite bloated quite quickly often that results to an overall reduced intake of food and then because you're not eating as much as what you normally would often that results to weight loss and if that is you and you're struggling with these things then what i spoke up before doesn't apply and at this point you want to be focusing on nutrition support so with nutrition support you're trying to have and it's a very high calorie high protein diet that's your focus you're aiming for as many calories per mouthful because we appreciate when you've got these symptoms when you're feeling unwell you're losing weight we know that the number of mouthfuls per day is probably going to be quite limited so we want as many calories as much protein as we can per mouthful so healthy eating, what I talked about before, would not be applicable in this sort of circumstance at this moment in time if, if you are one of those individuals sort of struggling with these symptoms. So often we suggest actually try to prevent any weight loss and anything sort of 10% or above is what we call sort of clinically significant. So actually if you have lost quite a lot of weight, then actually it might be that, and if you're struggling with your oral intake, it might be that you speak to your doctor or your nurse and see if you can be referred to a dietitian, or it might be that we start you on some supplement drinks to try and improve your nutrition as well. I apologize for all the information that's on this this sort of slide it's quite um quite a lot to take in but I kind of just wanted to highlight sort of what the the dietary changes you could be making depending on what your symptoms are and I've kind of put in blue sort of like these arrows is actually it's quite a vicious cycle often when you lose weight you feel tired when you're feeling tired you don't want to eat you've got these taste changes and often these are sort of um not necessarily linked but they're um sort of it's not just one it, you know I I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not just, you might not just experience one symptom, it might be many other symptoms. And say, if you're losing weight, you're not eating, you're not eating, it then makes you feel more fatigued because you're fatigued, you then don't eat. And so it's that kind of vicious cycle, which we want to try and break and try and improve your nutrition through oral intake. So for example, if you're on the top left, if you're losing weight, early satiety, so feeling full quite quickly, it might be that we start implementing food fortification. So that's where you've got your as many calories per mouthful. So it's adding plenty of cream, butter, cheese, using full fat options at this point to two things. So for example, you're adding your cream, cheese, butter to, for example, mash, and it doesn't necessarily make the volume of that food any bigger. It doesn't make the portion size any bigger, but per mouthful, you've got more calories, more protein. Again, using nourishing drinks. So even buying things like any milkshake powder or something from the supermarket, adding that with um, some full fat milk and having that as a nourishing drink can just help add the extra calories in. 
in because often if you feel quite full quite quickly often people tell me actually I can I can drink a lot better but I really struggle to eat and if that's the case it's maybe focusing more on those nourishing drinks again using skimmed milk powder is a good way of actually adding extra calories in so with skimmed milk powder you add say four tablespoons I think to a pint of milk and you shake it up and you can use that milk throughout the day you can use it on your cereal and your tea coffee making up any of your drinks um of using it to cook with as well so it just adds the extra calories in without making any difference to the taste that much or to the volume of the product that you're adding it to again trying to prioritize at this point your protein your carbohydrates it's not to say you can't have fruit and vegetables but if for example on the plate you can only manage maybe half the plate and rather you have half the plate full of your carbohydrates and your protein because that's actually that's more nourishing for you at the moment in time if, especially if you're losing weight and struggling with your food intake if you were to have fruit and vegetables it's maybe adding something that's high in calories with it so say for example if you're having like your vegetables it's maybe having like a cheesy sauce or creamy sauce with it to add the extra calories in or if you're having fruit it's maybe having with like a, a thick and creamy yogurt ice cream or some cream or something to add the extra calories in with that fruit as well again you might find that smaller portion sizes are a bit easier for you to manage so you're not overwhelming yourself with food and often I have individuals tell me you know my partner dishes up my food and they always give me too much. And I would say, oh, maybe try giving them a smaller plate. So when, when you've got a smaller plate and you try and dish it up, you can't really pile on that much food because it fills the plate straight away. So that might be some of, some of the ways that you could try and solve that as well. Using this little and often approach, trying to have, say, you know, your breakfast, your lunch and your evening, but also maybe add in a few more snacks because of smaller portions, maybe have a mid-morning snack, mid-afternoon snack, and then an evening sort of supper or something like that before bedtime. Again, if you're sort of fatigued or you've got dry mouth from the bottom left, just making the most of sort of ready meals, convenient foods. If you know you're going for chemotherapy and, you know, after chemotherapy, you know, you're going to have a few days where you feel really, really tired. Then before chemotherapy, it might be just worth having maybe batch cooking and putting food in the freezer so you can get that out quite quickly. And just microwave it um, when you're feeling unwell or even having sort of things like your tinned your tinned soups or you know things that are quite easy ready meals that's not a problem to have and I know it's processed and before we're talking in healthy eating we should be reducing your ready meals your processed food but actually at this moment in time healthy eating isn't the priority the priority is trying to get you as fit and well so that you can recover as quickly as you can from your treatment and go through treatment as well you might find that if you've got a sore mouth and sloppy kind of softer foods plenty of sauce plenty of gravy can just help food slide down a bit quicker a bit easier as well so it's not as harsh to your mouth again if you're fatigued the last thing you want is to be sitting at a table you know with a knife and fork and having to cut up your meal because it's just so exhausting anyway you probably want to be eating just you know almost like pork mashable food pie shepherd's pie you know things like that just to that are easy quite easy to chew doesn't require a lot of effort to actually just sort of facilitate that eating as well again you might find that if you've got sort of a dry mouth sucking on ice cubes boiled sweets sometimes can just help stimulate that saliva as well sipping on nourishing drinks throughout the day to give you that little boost of energy but also making sure you're hydrated as well and you can just hydrate that dry mouth as well so nausea and vomiting on your top right so I know there was a question that I submitted asking what my thoughts were on a fasting diet and actually using a fasting diet to minimize the effects of nausea post chemotherapy and um, my thoughts on a fasting diet is I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it and the reason is because actually at this moment in time there's not enough concrete evidence to suggest to suggest that fasting diets definitely help with the symptoms of nausea or, or improving quality of life as such the studies that are available are very limited the very um, small sample sizes and so they're not produced they're not randomized control trials that we normally suggest for evidence-based things so actually the studies are very small in sample sizes and often actually the sample sizes although they're small you have a high dropout rate as well because actually it's so difficult for individuals to follow so if you're an individual who's on a fasting diet my thoughts are actually there's not enough evidence to suggest that it does help if you are keen to continue with a fasting diet, I'd probably suggest getting in touch with sort of someone from your medical team or speaking to a dietitian and asking just for their support so they can help and guide you and just talk through your thoughts a bit more as well. And um, with regards to fasting, it might be that, you know, after chemotherapy, you'll have a couple of days where you might feel worse. And actually, whilst you're fasting, you might find it helps with that nausea because you're not eating and you're not inducing that kind of nausea as sometimes food can be a trigger for that nausea. But it's not necessary to say that it's the fast itself that's stopping that nausea. It's actually even 
even if you had a reduced oral intake, just having little and often, that also might not induce that nausea as well. But actually, the little and often approach would even give you some nourishment, and then you can build on your diet quicker as well to keep you in a good nutritional status. Whereas when you're fasting, you're almost starving yourself, and it might not be necessary, especially if you're a vulnerable individual going through treatment. And often with fasting diets in the studies, even animal studies, they've seen lots and lots of weight loss. So I probably suggest if you have lost lots of weight, try to implement implement some of this nutritional support advice and if you're struggling or you've lost a lot of weight it might be that you speak to some of your, some of your medical team or even get a referral to a dietitian so we can support you through that to maybe help you gain some more weight again if in terms of sort of nausea and vomiting what i do suggest is if you experience it it's maybe speaking to your medical team so that they can start you on some anti-emetic so anti-sickness medication and making sure you take that time before meals so it gives it enough time to kick in before your meal comes. Often people tell me it's the smell of the food, it's the sort of the, the hot foods in particular kind of sometimes trigger that nausea, nausea. So it might be that you go for more of the colder foods, the colder options, smaller portions so you don't overwhelm yourself and you don't feel too full from it as well. I often say, you know, some people find that the nausea, for example, might be worse in the morning but gets better during the day. And if that's the case, I suggest just try and manage your food intake around that. So if you find that nausea is worse in the morning, it's maybe you just have something small and then make up for it later on when your nausea is settled in the evening to have maybe a bigger portion then. Try to avoid skipping meals because sometimes actually having an empty stomach can almost make things worse as well. You feel a lot more fatigue and then you've got the barriers from fatigue as well, implementing and um, sort of uh, impacting your oral intake as well. And often with sort of when you skip meals, I often sort of say to individuals, sometimes you'll say, oh, I'm not hungry in the morning, so I'll skip it. And then lunchtime comes and say, oh, I'm not hungry again. I don't feel very well. And they skip it, skip the meal again. And by the end of the day that, you know, by the time you know it, you've gone the whole day without eating anything. And that's one of my concerns for individuals. So I would suggest try and have something small, even if it's like a small snack, like a yogurt pot or, you know, a custard pot, something that's individually packed. It doesn't need to be overwhelming, just something small to try and get you going that lives an often approach as well some people will find that sort of taste changes again so they might lack in taste if you're lacking in taste you've got no taste maybe it's going for more of the sharper stronger flavors things like your sort of your curries um, or things like your spice lemon lime herbs to try and add that flavor to the food if you find that you've got a heightened sensitivity to food or to drinks it might be that you go for more of the blander options if a food tastes awful, say, for example, some people say bread tastes like cardboard or tastes like dust, then just don't have it. You don't have to force yourself to eat it, but it's making sure you have something as an alternative. So bread would be a good carbohydrate. If you don't have that, maybe have some cereal instead of something or uh, a glass of milk with, you know, some so like a yogurt pot or something like that. Do you know something that's different? So it's not to say you can't can't have it it's maybe just don't have it for the time being reintroduce it at a later date you might find that your taste changes again and you can tolerate it a bit better again sort of colder foods might have less taste so you might find that's a bit better um again sort of people might say that they have a metallic taste and often that might happen with red meat so red meat it might be that you marinate it before you cook it and see if that covers up that metallic taste try sort of alternative protein rich sources so things like you your chicken or um sort of plant-based proteins your beans pulses lentils tofu soya and um, corn again you know sometimes even changing your cutlery so instead of using met metal cutlery it's maybe going for more of a plastic or wooden cutlery to see if that changes that sort of metallic taste as well so i know there was also a question about what my thoughts were on taking a multivitamin master on treatment and i suggest actually if you're an individual who's really struggling with the nutrition and you need to implement this nutrition support. So trying to implement this dietary advice that I'm sort of explaining here, but you're only managing maybe about less than half your meals. You've not got a variety. You've not got that fruits and vegetables. You're very limited. Your food is quite basic. Then I probably would be recommending a multivitamin at this point because actually there's, you're not gonna get that from your diet. But what I would suggest is sometimes some individuals are already on like a, a, a multivitamin supplement. It might be like thiamine or a vitamin B supplement, or it might be folic acid or something. And if you're already on one of those, then it might be worth just speaking to your medical team or your local pharmacist to see, you know, because you don't want to be taking multivitamin, which has those already, because you might be over exceeding what you need from that that mineral vitamin so it's just maybe speaking to your medical team is that okay if you have this multivitamin according to what you're already taking as well or your pharmacist with regards to a low fiber diet 
So I know there's some questions and, and I think someone asked that um, sort of where can they get more resources from? So if you've been recommended a low fibre diet from your medical team or from the hospital, what I would suggest is speak to your local trust, your local hospital and see if that dietetic department have sort of dietary advice regarding low fibre diet because it's always best to go back to your local trust. But by all means, if you can't and there isn't any information, then Leeds Teaching Hospitals on our website, we have a lot of our, pretty much all of our diet sheets, our diet booklets, and there's a low fiber diet sheet on there as well. And there's PDF copies, which you can download and use as, as a guide. Often individuals might be on a low fiber diet that's recommended and guided by the medical team if they're at risk of a bowel obstruction. So somewhere in your gut, there may be a narrowing or some sort of what um, risk of obstruction if there's a narrowing and so you want to have a low fiber diet so then it reduces that risk of of your stools obstructing in that narrowing area again if you're bloated or if you've got lots of diarrhea it might be that you want to consider reducing that dietary fiber to help relieve some of those symptoms but by all means if that continues with a low fiber diet and you're still really struggling i would definitely seek medical advice just for their input as well and their support so with regards to the low fiber diet, there's two main sources of fiber. Sorry, there's two main types of fiber. There's insoluble and there's soluble fiber. So soluble fiber is fiber that dissolves in water. It's broken down by your gut in your um, by the bacteria in your lower gut and it produces sort of gas and the bulk and energy um, and it produces sort of the bulk of the stool, stools and what that does is it increases the number of bowel movements so insoluble doesn't dissolve in water it's not digested by your gut bacteria and what that does is it almost bulks out your stools and it draws water into your bowel so it almost like softens the stools and makes it a bit more bulky so overall by reducing your overall fiber content you're reducing the number of bowel movements per day but also you reducing the bulkiness of those stools so it'd be a lot softer a bit more sloppy so it kind of if you're in a bowel obstruction you've not got you reduce that risk of that obstruction because it passes a little bit easier so with regards to sort of your fiber rich foods it's generally in your cereals and um, sort of in your your, your carbohydrates of so your bread your whole grain options it's in your fruits and vegetables predominantly as well especially in the sort of the skin the seeds the pips the stalks the pits so it's trying to remove that as much as possible but overall actually we don't suggest sort of eliminating soluble or insoluble in particular because actually the foods that are rich in fiber generally contain both so to, to try and to simplify things we just suggest sort of reducing the overall fiber dietary fiber rather than just one or the other of the soluble or insoluble so you're trying to reduce the overall fiber content so with regards to carbohydrates it's quite a straightforward switch you're opting for your white bread your white pasta your white rice rather than your whole grain seeded sort of um sort of um your bran flakes and things like that it's maybe going for more of your rice krispies your cornflakes potato with no skin on avoiding your sweet potato with regards to protein so you want to be avoiding all beans and pulses because they're very very high in fiber you want to avoid also hard gristly meat not because of the fiber because meat doesn't contain any fiber in it's just if it's hard and gristly meat it can be a risk of obstruction because it's harder to digest and to chew so what i suggested with meat just cook it thoroughly make sure it's really soft and tender and chew thoroughly as well so then it's a bit easier to digest Excuse me. With regards to sort of your fruits and vegetables, so um, leads we suggest actually try to limit your portion of fruits and vegetables to two portions, so one of each. So one portion of fruits, one portion of vegetable per day only, and try to remove as much of the skins, the pips, the seeds, the stalks, the pits from that fruit or vegetable as much as possible and try to choose more of the lower fiber options. So that'd be things like, you know, um, your tinned fruit, so like your your peaches, your pears, um, apple, stewed apple, that'd be fine for you to have, your plums, it's avoiding things like avoiding your, your sort of your berries with lots of seasons, so like your strawberries, um, your kiwis, your celery, things that are quite hard, lots of roughage, lots of seeds that you can't avoid. So um, again, with sort of if you're a vegan or you follow a vegetarian diet, then what I suggest, and if you've been asked to follow a low fiber diet, I think that'd be quite hard. It's a bit more difficult because actually your diet will be predominantly plant based, which in general will be a bit more higher in fiber anyway. So it'd be a bit more restricting for you. So what I would suggest is maybe seek some dietary advice from a, a dietitian so that they can support you through it. 
again, you might be at a greater risk of sort of constipation by reducing that fiber intake. So just making sure you drink plenty of water, aiming for at least sort of eight to 10 glasses of water a day. And if, you, if you're still struggling with constipation, then what I suggest is maybe seeking some advice from the medical team as you might need to start some laxatives or something to get your bowels going for the time being. With regards to stomas, so there's two different types of stomas. So on the right, you've got your colostomy. So that's when part of your large bowel is brought to the surface to form that opening. And that opening is called a stoma. Your ileostomy is when your small bowel is brought to the surface to form an opening, so to form that stoma. So with colostomy, you've got sort of your normal gut. And so you'll absorb all your nutrients, you'll absorb all the water in your large colon, and then you your stools will come out in your stoma. And that should be sort of quite soft to firm stools. Generally, once that stoma settles, you'll be following sort of the healthy eating advice as I re recommended at the start of the presentation. If you've got an ileostomy, what happens is because you've got that opening and it's your small bowel that is brought to the surface to form the opening, you're sort of bypassing all of your large bowel, which is where your water is predominantly absorbed. So what it means is that your stoma output generally is a bit more soft, a bit more liquidy. So you're kind of thinking normally is roughly about sort of porridge type of consistency or sort of like toothpaste like consistency. So it's a bit more liquidy in comparison to a colostomy output. Again, you maybe start with a low fiber diet to begin with, but once you know your, your stoma output becomes normal with an ileostomy, once it becomes normal, then you reintroduce the high fiber foods one at a time, just like you would with at the start of the presentation with the healthy balanced eating. So there's not necessary foods that you need to be avoiding. Some foods you might find cause a bit of wind or odor, but again, if you don't mind that and you can tolerate that, then it's fine for you to have. It's just be careful of any blockages. So it's just making sure that you chew your food thoroughly, it's soft, you chew it thoroughly before you then eat it and swallow it. I always recommend, I guess the takeaway point from this would be, you know, with your stoma, just watch out for what's normal for you. And once you know what's normal, you know, it might be that you go X amount of times a day, as long as you know that's your normal and that's your normal output, when you start reintroducing foods, you'll be able to tell if a food has made a difference to your output, if it's increased it at all or anything like that. So it's just making sure you know what's normal for you. And each individual will be different as well. So you'll have different stoma outputs according to how your body reacts to it as well. So once you know you have a normal output, um, uh, then actually you're just aiming for healthy eating advice as per the start of this presentation from that healthy balanced eating. With regards to, I kind of had this page and it's just to sort of give you a bit more, um, maybe a bit more of a practical tips during this lockdown. Cause I appreciate with lockdown you sh or shielding even, you know, you're probably limited in terms of the number of times you can go to the supermarket. It might be limited on what you can buy at the supermarkets. So I guess my first picture on the top left was just to suggest making sure that your cupboards are stocked. So you've got, you know, you've got your beans, your pulses, you know, things that st keep for a long time. They don't perish as quickly, rice, flour, pasta, you know, having your treats, your snacks. If you're trying to implement that um, food fortification advice, it's making sure you've got those, you know, things that are high in calories as well. Sometimes even sort of, um, again, if you've not got sort of the right variety in, in your fruits and vegetables, if say your fresh fruits and vegetables, you run out, actually using some of that, those tinned vegetables are also okay. You know, frozen vegetables, they're also okay to increase the variety in your diet, but also add that color to your diet as well to make it a bit more appealing. In your Middle, I've just got some sort of cereal again so if you're nutrition support then having cereal sometimes can be a good snack to have it's something quite light it's easy doesn't require a lot of time to make it up so you know that's a good way of getting extra calories in it's also fortified with your minerals and vitamins again on your top right you've got your dried fruit again it's not perishable you can add it you know introducing your your five a day or more than five a day your fruit and vegetables a day it counts as one of those you've got your extra fiber in there you can increase your calorie intake if you're trying to fortify your food as well your bottom left it's kind of just talking about you start your carbohydrates making sure you stock your cupboards up again you've got plenty of pasta you've got your potatoes keeping them in the fridge to keep a bit longer bread if you live on your own then you know even freezing bread can keep it for a bit longer as well to make sure that you've got this kind of quick simple meals available especially if you're um sort of um struggling with your nutrition support or if you just want a variety in your diet if you're a healthy individual but you're sort of shielding a bit more you don't get as much opportunity to shop then it's just making sure you have that variety so you've got those options again in the middle at the bottom sort of and uh, the bottom sort of row 
um, are just to suggest sort of nourishing drinks as well. So even things like skimmed milk powder, if you run out of milk, it's maybe using UHT milk or having that just stored in your cupboard, just one bottle. You don't need to open it, but just in case you can't get milk or you know, having skimmed milk powder again, you can use that as an alternative to milk as well. Again, bottom right, you've got your sort of your cheese, your dairy. Again, you can freeze your cheese. It goes a longer way. And um, even things like your custard pots, rice puddings, you know, like they don't need to be stored in the fridge. So again, you can keep them in your cupboard you can have them as a snack or as a pudding if you can't get hold of sort of your fresh puddings and things from the supermarkets just to increase that variety and, and just to give yourself that treat as well so with regards to sort of this slide here i've got quite a lot to cover and thank you so much all for listening so far so i just wanted to talk through often um the sort of the misconceptions of of the diet so things like um so to start with you know there's been questions actually submitted as well you know should i be avoiding sugar does sugar feed my cancer should i be following a ketogenic diet and i've kind of put them two together because actually a ketogenic diet is based basically a diet that's very high in fat and very high in protein very very low in carbohydrate and it's trying to in theory trying to cut out that sugar in your diet so the theory behind this is that all all cells need um whether it's cancer cells or healthy cells we all they all need sugar and they all need energy so sugar is the the pure form of energy so they all need sugar and so the theory is because cancer cells grow a lot more they use a lot more sugar and that leads to this suggestion that if you cut out sugar you then reduce that sort of growth of cancer. But actually, there's very, very, very limited information on this. There's not any sort of solid evidence to suggest this. And actually, in theory, you know, your body is very clever. So if your cancer cells, if you take out sugar in your diet, you're taking out all of your carbohydrates, your complex sugars, your starchy carbohydrates, your whole grains, which are actually fortified with lots of minerals and vitamins. They've got fiber in there. They're your first source of energy. Your body's very clever. If you cut that out, what happens is it starts breaking down your muscle, starts breaking down your fat, and it uses that up and converts it into energy. So actually your cancer cells will still continue to grow. And there's no evidence to suggest reducing sugar will stop the cancer growth. And there's no suggestion to say that increasing your sugar intake increases cancer. So it doesn't suggest that. But actually the thing of with sugar is that if we overeat excessive amounts of sugar, it can contribute towards weight gain and weight gain is linked with cancer or being overweight, there's links with cancer. So there's kind of the kind of the link, but actually I wouldn't be avoid, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest avoiding sugar. Actually, there's probably more harm in doing so because often it's a, it's a diet that's high in protein, high in fat, but often you've lost all the minerals and vitamins from your carbohydrates. You've lost a lot of that fiber content. You've not, you've taken out all your fruits and vegetables and actually they're, they're actually things that are promoting good health. So I would, I would, um, I wouldn't suggest this. If that's the case, I wouldn't suggest sort of reducing sugar or from or cutting out sugar. Reducing added sugar is good though. Just not get that confused. Um, so should I be following an alkaline diet? So an alkaline diet is basically, um, so this kind of comes from the theory that cancer cells enjoy being in acidic environment. And so by having an alkaline diet, the suggestion is then you then make that a less favorable environment for the cancer cells. But actually there's no evidence to suggest that having an alkaline diet will change the environment of the cancer cells because there's actually what happens is our bodies our kidneys are very clever and so they get rid of any waste so what will happen is when you have an alkaline diet what will happen it will change the ph of your urine because your kidneys will get rid of all that extra alkali and then it will sort of get it all get rid of it all in your urine so it will change your ph but it won't change necessarily your body's sort of your body ph because actually our bodies are clever and we 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 like to work in tight ranges as well for for cells to be able to function well. So actually there's no suggest, there's no evidence suggest that an alkaline diet would help with cancer. And actually with an alkaline diet, you end up removing a lot of your meat, your dairy, um, sort of foods that are high in protein. And again, you've got the essential minerals and vitamins in that. And so actually I'd really be, um, I'd be concerned if someone was eliminating all of that in the diet as well. So I wouldn't suggest following an alkaline diet and I wouldn't suggest um, following a ketogenic diet or a very low sugar diet or anything like that.
So there's another question. So should I be avoiding dairy or soy products? You know, especially if someone's got like a, a hormone receptor sort of type of cancer. And um, there was a question asking, you know, are there any foods that I should be avoiding? And I guess the theory behind soy products, the concern for individuals would be that, you know, soy products, there's news that actually the, the, there's like a compound in soy products, which kind of mimic um, the sort of similar um, similar components to estrogen and that's sort of one of the major hormones in, in females and actually at the moment in time there's again no concrete evidence suggests that actually having dairy or soy products linked to, to, to the development of cancer or the growth of cancer there's not enough evidence to suggest that and I also wouldn't be recommending avoiding it because actually the soy products will be again if you're a vegan or vegetarian the soy products will have all of your fortified minerals and vitamins they're also a really good source of non-meat protein um, rich sources so actually they're really good options for you to have in a varied healthy balanced diet but also your dairy products is a major source of your calcium so it's got you so it gives you good bone health as well so by avoiding it with very little information and data to prove that it does anything to the cancer it's probably more uh, detrimental because actually you're eliminating that from your diet which will have lots of um which and they provide lots of health healthy sort of healthy minerals and vitamins and they provide that balance in our diet so i should suggest that you shouldn't avoid dairy or you and you shouldn't avoid soya products so will eating superfoods help fight cancer? So superfoods are given to a, the, um, sort of a, a label given to certain foods which have health properties. So lot, lots of, sort of things like your blueberries or your kale, you know, they've got antioxidant um, sort of elements to the, the food and they promote antioxidants and things like that. And that's why they're called superfoods. But actually, you know, these are all very much based in sort of the sort of cell of studies so laboratory studies not quite yet in human or animal studies yet again you know the the ones that are in animals uh, you know all the studies that do show in animal studies the doses the type of that compound that used isn't replicable in your dietary intake it's a lot higher doses which we wouldn't be consuming that amount in our diet anyway from naturally from food so what i suggest is you don't necessarily have to have the superfoods the superfoods will be part of a healthy balanced diet so you can include them but excessive amounts you probably wouldn't want you wouldn't need you just eat them as you would with your five a day your fruits and vegetables a healthy balanced diet so actually it doesn't help necessarily to fight cancer at this moment in time we don't have that evidence to suggest that so should i be following a paleo diet so paleo diet is very much like and um, the stone age type of diet. So very kind of simple foods, reducing the processed foods, which I think is good. So you re reduce that kind of processed food, your ready meals, the foods that are quite high in sort of the sugar and things like that. But actually a paleo diet, you end up eliminating a lot of your whole grains, your cereals, you eliminate all of your dairy products, which again, provide lots of minerals, vitamins, essential minerals and vitamins, essential fibers, and also, it sort of reduces that calcium intake as well. So it's, I mean, at this moment in time, I wouldn't suggest anything like that. I think overall the theory of reducing the processed food is good, but actually limiting it to just sort of the paleo diet, which is predominantly high in sort of your fat and high in protein, doesn't necessarily need to be implemented. I think a overall balanced, healthy diet would be appropriate. So I guess there's a, there was also a question, you know, is there a special diet to be following with ovarian cancer? And hopefully, you know, actually just sort of this slide explaining actually there isn't enough evidence to suggest that these would fight or promote or reduce cancer or anything like that. There's not enough evidence to suggest that. But also a lot of these sort of specialist diets, paleo diet, alkaline diet, ketogenic diet, you're always eliminating something from a diet and you're not replacing it with anything else. And that's my concern. So firstly, there's not enough evidence to promote it, but also because you're eliminating some elements or some food groups, you're then missing out on a lot of the minerals and vitamins and the nutrients that are from that food group, which are really important for a balanced, healthy diet. So is there a special diet that you should be following with ovarian cancer? I suggest it depends on your situation. If you're an individual who's, um, you know, you're healthy, fit and well, no nutritional concerns, you've got a good appetite, then follow the healthy eating advice as per what I've spoken about at the, front, at the, at the start of this presentation, according to the World Cancer Research Fund. If you're an individual the same, but maybe a bit overweight, um, then I suggest um, so I just suggest that actually would be sort of maybe suggestions of weight management and things like that. But again, if you're an individual on treatment, losing lots of weight, then actually um, nutrition support would probably be your best sort of option for that.
So these are just some useful links, and I'm so sorry I'm over time. So there's just some useful links. I just want to highlight at the bottom. I know there's a question about sort of stomas and actually getting some extra support. So the Eliostomy and Internal Pouch Association, that's got really good, um, that's a really good website regarding stomas and actually can look at sort of the local networks as well that are available and the local group supports as well are on there and some information on that. Again, at the bottom, there's the Crohn's and Colitis UK. It's a different disease. It's not related to ovarian cancer, but there's a really good section of living with a stoma which might be quite helpful just for some extra advice and some support there's a Leeds teaching hospital sort of website for that patient information if you look onto patient leaflets again the BDA so British Dietetic Association you've got really really good food fact sheets available on there and so if you just type into google BDA and whatever so whether it be and fiber and calcium then you've got some really good reliable evidence-based information on there again sort of NHS live well there's also a site that says like NHS behind the headline and often what happens is when an article is released, NHS behind the headlines will write an article, article to sort of explain what that study suggests and what the conclusions are, which could be quite helpful and a bit more insight to it. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry for overrunning, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. I think that was excellent. Um, so yeah, thank you so much um, for joining us and thank you to Janet for that wonderful presentation. We hope you found it beneficial. Um, we're now going to begin the Q&A section of the webinar. So Janet, I think you did a wonderful job of um, covering sort of foods to avoid um, and discussing the common misconceptions around that as well. Um, but we have had a question pre-submitted and I can see in the um, comments as well that someone else has mentioned it, um, that some ovarian cancers have the hormone receptors for either estrogen or progesterone on the surface of their cells. Um, so are there any specific foods that should be avoided for those? Um, and who would you advise speaking to about that? Are there any resources that might be helpful? So with regards to sort of your hormone receptors, there's nothing to suggest that actually increasing. So I think um, when you type that in, often often what comes up on the on sort of the websites is that it's sort of your dairy products, your soy products, and it's that um, when you look into it a bit more, there's not actually enough evidence to suggest that avoiding those foods will um, promote that cancer growth or promote that cancer activity. So firstly, there's not enough evidence for it, but also the theory is because with, so for example, with soy products, it's often, it's, it's a compound called isoflavones. So isoflavones are, it's what they call cytoestrogen. So it's like a plant-based compound, but very similar, it looks very similar to estrogen. And so actually often there's this thought of, oh, well then that promotes um, sort of the receptors on the cancer cells and promote its growth but actually when you look a bit deeper into the evidence actually they, they there's the body's very complicated and and it's not just that one type of you know receptor there's lots of different subtypes of receptor, receptors on those cells so actually those foods at this moment in time don't suggest that that does do anything to the cancer and actually my concern is actually if you start removing that cancer uh, sorry removing that um those food groups within your diet there's probably more harm in that because actually there's lots of benefits from having that as an alternative so for example soya and dairy products again there's this concern that the dairy products will have hormones and actually the concentration of the hormone in that sort of dairy product is very minimal in comparison to the hormones in our bodies and so actually by if you go by actually what there is sort of the messages out there and if we start reducing our sort of soya we start reducing our dairy products and actually there's more harm in 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 removing that food group from our in our in our diet yeah so at this moment in time there's not enough evidence suggests that there are links to that and i think again when there is sort of some information it's, it's often from sort of cell laboratory studies so not necessarily human trials and again you know how a cell reacts in like a petri dish is very different to how our cells react in our bodies as well and our bodies are very complicated okay thank you Wonderful. Um, we've also had, um, I know we've answered some questions on supplements. Um, we've had an, another question submitted about um, sort of alternative medis um, medicines. Yeah. Um, so how useful and safe do you think alternative medicines such as colloid, ooh, can't even say it, colloidal silver and CMP elixir are in fighting ovarian cancer? Yeah. Um, so with regards to um, with regards to alternative medicine, I, I would become, I wouldn't support it at all. 
And I think the reason that they're called alternative medicine is because actually there's not enough evidence to suggest that it works. And that's why we don't use it in conventional medicine, which is kind of the, the more of the, the first line, second line that we use in hospitals and things like that. I think often the, the danger with these alternative medicines is that we don't know enough about it. So we don't know if whether it actually does work um, but also we don't know what harm it can do. And I think that's probably my major concern because if you're on treatment and then you take these as well, you don't know how they're going to interact because there's not enough information out there to suggest that. And I think if there was evidence to suggest that, then I think we'd be adapting it within our, in, within our practice as professionals. But there's a reason why we're not, because there's not enough evidence to suggest that. And I did have a look from, because it's a pre-submitted question that I was looking into, and it's this co colloidal silver and CMP elixir. And you know, actually, when I was looking into it, actually, it's really hard to find the evidence that's backed it up as well. And I think that's quite a big concern as well. You, you look up and it'll be these websites are promoting it. But actually, when you look into how, why they're promoting it, what is, what is the theory behind this? Why is it beneficial? And why is it fighting the cancer? How is it doing that? Actually, there's no explanation to it. And there's no evidence. There's no suggestions. There's no human trials. There's no hard, large human studies to suggest or anything like that. And so my concern is it's a very foreign thing that we don't know and we don't know what harm it can do. So my suggestion is that actually I'd avoid taking it. And if you are very keen on taking it, what I would suggest is maybe speak to your medical team to tell them and inform them that you are taking it and so they can look into it a bit more as well to suggest actually what, what kind of, what things it might do. Okay. Wonderful, thank you, Janet. Um, we've had a question submitted in on the chat. Um, so again, just based on supplements, um, what is the view on supplements like omega-3 omega for osteoarthritis? Oh, for osteoarthritis and omega-3. So I think with regards to um, omega-3 and omega-6, I guess omega-3 is almost like an anti-inflammatory type of um, uh, os um, I don't think I know enough of osteoarthritis to suggest whether you should be taking it or not. I think if you can, do you know, um, omega-3 is a really good source from sort of oily fish and your, um, your, your sort of nuts and seeds and things like that. And if you can, I'd probably suggest maybe having it from a dietary source rather than a supplement, if you can manage those foods. But with regards to its effect, I mean, I think the theory behind it might be that omega-3 is an anti-inflammatory um, sort of product or its benefits. And if you're osteoarthritis, it means that actually you've got a flare up in your bones somewhere or flare up in your joints. So the link between the two, I'm not sure how much of a benefit that would be, but what I suggest is if you can get it from food and we do recommend, you know, having oily fish once or twice a week, you know, we do recommend having your nuts and seeds, your healthy fats. So don't see why you couldn't have that from food if you can manage food orally. Thank you. Um, so just moving on to um, sort of dietary um, advice around treatment. So mm -hmm. I think you've really covered chemo quite well. So I know there was a lot of um, side effects um, suggested by women that I think you've sort of covered. Um, but someone is um, currently on maintenance treatment. So um, taking a lap rib and she's been on it for a month. Um, and she said it's making her constantly hungry. Um, so she's therefore put on a lot of weight. Um, so she's a bit concerned about that. And is there anything that you... Um, could suggest that she eats to help with this hunger or any advice to cut down this feeling? Yeah, um, so I'm not really that familiar with a lap rib. With regard to that, I think if it does stimulate an appetite and the individual's eating a lot more and has gained a lot of weight, what I suggest is trying to implement, implement maybe of the healthy eating advice. So if you are eating a lot more, it's maybe just cutting down your portion sizes if possible. If you're still feeling hungry, it's maybe snacking on the healthier options, just snacking on kind of your fruit and vegetables, choosing more of your lower fat options. So if you are eating food, it's trying to reduce the calorie intake where possible to prevent any of that excess calorie, which will cause that weight gain. Again, trying to be a bit more mobile, a bit more and um, sort of doing a bit of exercise or something like that to, to make sure that you're, you're burning up the calories as well. 
And again, I think sometimes if you eat a bit more during the day, then you, and if you're a bit more active during the day, you'll end up burning that more off rather than, you know, having a large meal in the evening and then going to bed straight away where you don't burn off that energy at all. So it's maybe just basing, maybe having a larger portion during the day when you're a bit more active and then try to reduce the amount that you eat in the night when you're less active so that you're then burning off the energy a bit more. Try to overall reduce kind of the, the energy intake in total. So try to reduce your calorie intake to prevent that weight loss, but also increasing your activity levels as well. I know there was a question about lapa ribbon also um, uh, grapefruit wasn't there as well, Soraya. So I think regards to that, I think so the theory, I think so I had a look on the BNF. So BNF Nice is often a really good website to look at the interactions with drug and food and things like that. So I think so it suggests that grapefruit increases the levels and the exposure of a lapa rib. So that's why they suggest avoiding it. And it's the same often, um, grapefruit is often a culprit for things like statins, you know, your, your blood pressure tablets as well. You know, often they advise you to, to not have grapefruit in those as well. And it's because there's that interaction. I think it increases the levels of lapa rib. And again, if you're on a maintenance dose of, of a, a treatment, then obviously the doctors want to know the dose is gonna be the same so they can predict your treatment rather than if you're having uh, the amounts of sort of grapefruit and it, you know your doses start increasing and decreasing your blood levels because actually there's that interaction so we try and minimize that as much as possible yeah. wonderful thank you and um, we also had a few questions around post-treatment um diets as well um mm -hmm. so i think you've already touched on um the impacts of stomas and um, potential adhesions and bowel obstruction um and i know again that you covered the sort of the low fiber diets um, but we've also had a question um about post-surgery and whether women should be increasing their protein um, post-surgery and but whether that is dependent on weight because I know you mentioned um, about it being linked to weight loss um yeah we'll, we'll do that one for now <laughs> uh, as in, yeah so so with regards to sort of your your protein intake surgery would recommend making sure you have adequate protein it will probably depends on what kind of surgery you've had if you had a major operation then actually you probably need your calories and your protein to try and promote that wound healing promote that recovery and also encourage you to have that rehab so that you've got adequate and sufficient nutrition for that rehab as well yeah sorry what was the last bit of the question was that that was it and we've was got it? another question in um so i think two women have actually asked this on the chat um so um, some women who have gone through surgery are facing um, sort of a surgical induced menopause, so a bit yeah. earlier on. Um, so would you still recommend um, the amount of dairy that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, so I guess, it, you know, I think it's a fact, whether it's surgery induced or if it's natural because you're coming towards that age, the reason why we suggest to have more calcium in your diet is because you've got what happens is with menopause, um, you gradually reduce the amount of estrogen that you release into your blood and the estrogen reacts and, and helps sort of your bones maintain the calcium in there so actually if because the bones um so calcium stored in the bones and the estrogen that's in your blood makes sure that the, the the bones retain that calcium so if you've got an overall you've got menopause and you're experiencing menopause whether it's surgical or natural your body generally reduces its amount of estrogen that it produces it reduces that amount circulating your blood which means that you've got more calcium almost leaking out into your blood from your bones and to maintain that bone health you then want to increase your calcium intake from your dietary intake wonderful um, i think we've got maybe two questions left um so someone's mentioned that they're trying to lose weight um, using calorie counting mm -hmm. um, and she just wondered if there's a website that you would recommend to help uh, calculate this. So in terms of calorie sort of recommend, so in terms of sort of, I, I don't know, if it's, well, maybe websites, yeah, um, so I know that the, there's like a My Fitness Pal, that's quite a good app, it calculates your calorie requirements, you can kind of use it to gauge and almost like a food diary and calculates how much fats, calories, how much protein you have in the day in comparison to what your requirements are and it calculates it for you depending on how active you are, your age, your gender and things like that. So that could be an option. Again, I know NHS, sort of the weight loss plan, there's an NHS weight loss plan and the NHS have come, have done this sort of 12 week weight loss plan. So it's like dietary advice as well as activity, sort of exercise advice as well for, the, for 12 weeks to allow that gradual weight loss that we were talking about. And they've done that, NHS have done that in combination with 
and um, BDA, so the British Dietetic Association, which is one of the links. And it's a lot of a lot of dietitians sort of rely on the BDA, you know, for up to date evidence and things like that as well. So we really rely on. We really think that's a good good sort of website to use. So actually, NHS and BDA have done that together, which suggests that actually something we should be promoting and we we would kind of support as well. Um, I know even things like there's an app called Carbs and Cows. So often, you know, as dietitians, we have we have like a book. We use books ourselves to look at information and food information as well. I know Carbs and Cows is a book, but it's also an app. Um, and again, it kind of tells you how much calories, protein, fat, um, carbohydrates are in sort of foods, different portion sizes as well. And that can be a good way to calculate your calories, calculate kind of how, how to how to reduce that deficit as well. It can be also used to help facilitate that. Great, thank you Janet. Um, and our final question, and we'll try and bring it to a close now. Um, someone has asked about um, where to find good recipes. Do you have any suggestions for any websites or any books? Um, so in terms of recipes, I just I just usually Google. I, I don't have anything particular. I, I think you know if you were thinking of making like a shepherd's pie, just, I just type in shepherd's pie, look at the reviews, see which one has the best reviews, and I just go for that. Often, what I tend to do is I Google, look at all the recipes, and I look at reviews, and then maybe even compare. So I just say, oh, what I have in my cupboard, I don't have this ingredient, so I'll, I'll use a different recipe, or I'll kind of mix and match. So I kind of use that as a guide rather than recipes. Again, you know choosing your best sort of your favorite chef or something you know if you like Jamie Oliver or like anyone like that you know or I just type it in and, and see what comes up. Thank you so much Janet I think that was really useful um, so just before we close I just thought um, if we just asked Janet what her um, what she thinks the main thing she hopes someone will take away from today's session. Yeah um, so I guess from today's session I just really hope that um, you can feel confident in knowing what diet advice you, you should be putting in place. I think, you know, I hope that you can realize that the diet advice you follow will depend on your situation. So if you're going through treatment, then actually it might not be appropriate for you to follow you know, the healthy eating diet advice to begin with, or if you're post-surgery, or if you're losing weight and you're really struggling, then actually healthy eating advice might not be appropriate for you, but it doesn't mean that later on it wouldn't be. So I just really hope that you can identify where you're at and what's the most relevant information for you at this moment in time to be implementing. 